Thank you for joining us today for On the Road with Jesus, hosted by Rhody Fisher. As a Christian mom for over 40 years and a teacher of the Bible in public schools for 25 years, Rhody will take you on a journey with some of her friends as they share their experiences and testimonies from their walk with Christ. You'll see that you are not alone in your search for God, your victories with Him, or your failures. Welcome to On the Road with Jesus. Now, here's your host, Rhody Fisher. Good morning and welcome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the things that you do for us. We can't even breathe without your help. We mm-hmm. thank you, praise you, Lord. We ask that you would be with the viewers and Sean and I, and um, and of course, our, my special guest, John. Mm-hmm. Lord, bless the words that we speak, Lord. In Jesus' name, help us. Give us those words, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in Psalm 119, and um, as I said before, Psalm 19 is broken up into groups of eight, eight Mm -hmm. verses, and so we are in a group that's called Cuff. Um, I think it's pronounced like K-U-F, Cuff, but it's spelled Q-O-P-H, and that is the 19th letter of the Hebrew um, numbers. I mean, 19th letter of the Hebrew uh, alphabet. And it's also the nine, the, it signifies 19. Um, it is, it also has um, a picture of the eye of the needle. And if you take a look at the way they write that, it almost looks like the eye of the needle. There's a line that comes down and kind of a squirrely little P-like thing, like the letter P. So it kind of could be an eye of the needle. Um, But it is, it does signify that. And I believe it means um, children of promise. So we are in Psalm 119, verse 145. Give us understanding of your word, Lord. Um, It says here, I call with all my heart. Answer me, O Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me. I will keep your statues. I rise before dawn and cry for your help. I put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance with your love. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your laws. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are not far from but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, O Lord, and all your commands are true. Long ago, I learned from your statues that you established them to last forever. Wow, beautiful. Thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you would continue to use the word, Lord, in our lives since we recall all the things that you've taught us. I would like to introduce my guess to you viewers out there. You've seen him before. He's done a few shows for me. And I want to welcome back John Edmiston. Edmiston. That's right. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, John, welcome. Um, We've talked about this. We've known each other for quite a number of years, Mm -hmm. almost a couple of decades. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from um, Virginia. Mm. I do want you to, as a reminder, remind our guests about your um, journey, how you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Well, um, we've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to make it very short. I was an atheist that got saved trying to disprove the existence of God mathematically and scientifically or finishing off a science degree from in chemistry at the University of Queensland, came from a very rationalistic family. And uh, I just believed in that old fashioned scientific worldview and uh, that everything could be logically figured out, which, of course, it can't. 
Uh, and then I was trying to disprove this and God appeared to me as a light and spoke to me for about 20 minutes. And uh, I thought I'd discovered God. Uh, and so I decided to try and figure out which God. And after many questions and many months of searching, I decided it was the Christian God. But it was continuous. I believe I was born again when I when God appeared to me as a light and spoke to me. I believe I committed my life to, to, to Christ then. I just didn't know it was Jesus Christ. I knew this was the creator God of the universe that I committed myself to. And so then I uh, went to church history le lectures, <coughs> sorry, to try and figure out whether I was a Protestant or a Catholic. I decided I was a Protestant. Then from there, I looked into such, some issues and became a Baptist. And after that, uh, I became a more uh, spirit-filled uh, person. So uh, that was just a long journey. Uh, that, take, that took me a long time to sort myself out. But uh, just because I'm a very logical person, I don't jump to conclusions. But I was an atheist who God revealed himself to. Wow, beautiful. Now, I do want to ask one other question about your walk with the Lord, and that is, when did you have the calling on your life after? Now, how much longer was the calling on your life to be a pastor? About 18 months, I think. Okay. Uh, I read my, uh, my actually, it was called to be a missionary. I read my great grandmother's, grandfather's biography. Both my great grandfather, great grandmother wrote biographies. They were missionaries with Hudson Taylor in China. And she she was Jewish origin. She was part of the, the Cohen family, which is the English branch of the Rothschilds. And she came from an incredibly wealthy family. Her, her, um, her nanny led her to Christ, and it, so she went to Germany to get baptized. And when she, the rabbi, when the family found out she got baptized, they sent a rabbi over and she said, "Have you got baptized?" Yes. And she was cut off in Germany without a cent to her name. So she went from everything to nothing, and having to work with no work skills at sixteen. Eventually, ends up marrying my great grandfather, who was a doctor, a, 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 uh, and that caused an enormous amount of kerfuffle in uh, English society at the time. So they, to make everyone really mad at them, they ran off and became missionaries in China. <laughs> anyway, she was disinherited from millions and millions of pounds. Uh, wow. And, uh, and uh, so they served with Hudson Taylor, went through the Boxer Rebellion. So I read their biographies. I read my grandfather's biography and accepted that challenged me, uh, my great-grandfather's uh, biography, and, and it, that put a great challenge in my mind and my heart and i decided that uh, god called me sort of then and there and then that was confirmed a little bit later when i went to uh, papua new guinea on a mission trip wow oh my gosh that's beautiful mm. so today we're going to cover a subject um and I, you know years ago i said something to a friend of mine who was quite a bit older than me almost like 20 years mm. And at the time, I thought she was really old. She was in her 70s, mm. <laughs> and that's what I am now. But she, she, I said something to her that wasn't, you know, really nice. Yeah. And I said, you know, really, I want to apologize for that. And she said these words to me, Rhody, a mature Christian isn't easily offended. And I thought, wow. I've got to remember those lines <laughs> because I thought I kind of um, gave her like a little kick in the shin uh, with words as we sometimes do. And uh, she just so gently um, yeah. said that she um, forgave me. Mm. But tell us about growing in the Lord and becoming that mature Christian and the steps that we need to take to get there. Okay. Well, you get born again, and that's the start of the process. You can't mature without being born of the Spirit. And so you get born again, and then people say, oh, look, I've got my ticket to heaven. I've got my fire insurance. That's all I need. I prayed the prayer. I go to church sort of once a month. I wander around. I'll, I'll occasionally ask the pastor to pray for me. I'm fine. Well, that's not what the Bible says, you see. The Bible says you've got to grow in knowledge and in grace, and it, it has all these Bible passages that say, Oh, you've got to grow up and you've eventually got to end up like Jesus. And that's the goal. We're supposed to be conformed to the image of God's beloved son. And that's like, oh, and they're just going to start with one little passage. It's fairly well known, but the first bit of the verse is, is very well known. The rest aren't. So let's go to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. 
okay. we know that for those who love God, this is Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he also also whom he predestined he also called and those he called he justified those he justified he also glorified so all things work together for good in what way that they help us to become like jesus that's how they're working for our good it's not necessarily for the good of our bank account it's for the good of our character development so god is really into character development and he wants us to be a person of good character like your friend who was not easily offended and toughening up is part of that. You know, we've got to be a little less uh, frantic, a little less uh, of a control freak. I'm naturally a control freak. Uh, I uh, I like my eyes dotted, my T's crossed. I like my doctrine precise. Uh, and so I have to learn not to control others. I, and uh, I have a very strong wife who won't be controlled. <laughs> so I, I, I am very blessed with her. But I have to learn certain things that I have to let go of and, and let, let go and let God. And there's, everyone has lessons they have to learn and patience and all those things. And we have to grow to be more like Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis. And so there's a goal there. The goal is to be conformed to the image of his beloved son, to be like Christ. And, and it says again and again in the New Testament, put on Christ. So he put off the old man, put off those bad reactions, put off the bad temper, the bad language, the, the things that we shouldn't have in our life that are habits from old, and we put on Christ. And I'll give you one illustration of, of how we have old reactions that are into us. Our body, our mind, associates A to B, and we have a habit. We, we press this button and we get this reaction, and we're not supposed to have those, that A to B connection to be too tight. So I was off at Bible college. Now, when I was at high school, I was a skinny nerd. I got bullied a lot, and I had to learn how to fight back. And it was one of those high schools where, you know, sports crazy high school and nerds weren't appreciated. So uh, I, I had to learn to fight, but I'd become a Christian. I forgot about fighting, didn't want to fight anyone anymore. But the Bible college was out in the countryside, so I was walking out in the countryside after dinner one night. And some fellow students jumped me to try and surprise me. And immediately my fists went up and I was ready to whack them. And I thought, where did that come from? I don't want to whack anyone anymore. You know, I, why, why am I doing this? And within seconds I dropped my fist. I didn't hit anybody. Thank goodness for that. But it was ingrained into my fight or flight reaction in my body, in my mind, a long habit from long ago. And we've got to get rid of that stuff. We've got to put off the old nature. We have to put off our bad reactions, our bad habits. And we say, oh, but I can't help reacting that way. Yes, you can. The Holy Spirit's there to renew you, to give you the mind of Christ and to renew you into the image of Christ. And yes, you can get rid of that stuff if you put it off in a determined fashion, get rid of it, throw it in the trash can like you would old clothes you don't need anymore. You don't even take them to goodwill. You just get rid of these sinful clothes and we put on the rock garments of righteousness. So there's a pro procession, there's a, a progress bar which we try and grow in Christ and become a better person, a, a nicer person over the years. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a good illustration. Um, the righteousness of Christ is what we have on us. And, mm. and thank God we didn't have to earn it. Mm. We just received it. Mm. And and so um, as we grow in the Lord, um, I'm thinking getting into the Word of God is mm. one of the ways that we do that. Yes, we have to renew our mind. The best thing to you renew your mind with is with the Scriptures. Scripture is the Holy Spirit's textbook, and it's the, the the Word of God has power to transform us. We're born again of the Word. Uh, that's in. Uh, uh, second Peter, we're born again of God's living word, the eternal seed. So the word of God has to come into our hearts and minds. Just excuse me while I put a little bit of water here. It has to come into our heart and mind and gives us the framework of truth. Now, there's a, a, a thing in the Greek that's not in the English, and it talks about the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. 
says the mental framework. It's like we have a mental framework that we put truth into. And in Adam, he had a perfect mental framework, but it was, <coughs> sorry, empty. There was nothing in it. Uh, but if it had operated, it, truth would have shot in there, love would have shot in there, righteousness. It would have all gone perfectly, clickety-click, into Adam's renewed mind. But then after the fall, it all got twisted up. So mm -hmm. it's like those kids' pegboards that have the, the triangle, the circle, the hexagon, etc. And, and the, the little child, three-year-old child, has to put the right shapes in the right holes. Well, just say love is a circle and righteousness is a rectangle and uh, truth is a square and so on. Well, what happened when the pegboard got twisted, truth wouldn't go in there anymore. Love wouldn't go in there. It became sentimentality uh, and so on and so forth. And the pegboard's twisted so that only devious things could fit in there. And in the fallen mind that's hostile to God, it's easy for us to think wicked things and to admire the devil and, and, and admire bank robbers and everything like that as our minds have been messed up. And then as we follow Christ, God straightens out the pegboard, gives us this new phronema, the new framework of Christ. And, and so God's truth can fit in. And so a person who is not saved, they cannot understand spiritual things because they're spiritually discerned. But once we're saved and once the Holy Spirit's teaching us, we can, because we have the mind of Christ, we have this new framework, and that truth can pop in. So we need the Bible and we need the Holy Spirit to interpret the Bible to us. So when you open up your Bible, pray. Say, Lord, send the Holy Spirit into my heart and mind so I can understand this book. And he will. He'll renew the Bible to you. Now, early on in my life, I was called to be a missionary. And I knew I was going out to a very remote part of Papua New Guinea where there were no libraries of any sort. I would take a, a few books in a suitcase. That was it. No theological libraries. So I said, Lord, give me a terrific memory for Scripture because uh, I'm going to be in preaching in the middle of the jungles and nothing's going to be there, no electricity, no nothing. Uh, we live by kerosene lamps and everything like that. Uh, and so I knew I had to have it in my head. And so God gave me a tremendous memory for Scripture. I can't remember my grocery list. My wife gets furious. But, you know, I, by nature, I'm, a, I'm an absent-minded Bible teacher, but I have a tremendous supernatural memory for Scripture that I prayed for and got uh, and so it's a gift and you can ask God for the gift of understanding his word and that will help you to grow because the Holy Spirit will convict you of, uh, of all the things that you need to do and also show you the hope of God. So show you the hope that you can change. It's not a hopeless thing at all. Now, I know that this might sound a little simplistic um, and I, I, I teach third, fourth, fifth and sixth mm -hmm. graders the Bible in, in public schools and I've been doing it. I think that I just completed my 28th year, but um, I, I tell these little kids that they really need to get into the word mm -hmm. every single day, just like they're eating and breathing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I give them an example. How long do you think you can um, live without breathing, taking yep. another breath of air? And they'll say uh, a minute. 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Oh, exactly. But this is the air that we need to breathe in yeah. from this book. How long do you think you can eat without dying? Mm. And they'll, you know, oh, I can't even half a day. You know, <laughs> that's that. right. Yeah. And um, I'll go, exactly. People have lived up to 40 days, maybe a little bit more, but starving. Um, they they need this book every day yeah uh, how many how how long do you think you can go without water mm. and and i use these terms because god uses these terms yeah. for his word yeah. um and they say um water uh, maybe maybe uh, not even a day well you know maybe three days yeah at the very most and and we we as as spiritual beings after accepting after having that rebirth yeah. um with the birth of the spirit is what the lord says or being born from above you need to stay in this word mm. but oftentimes it becomes a challenge to um to get into the word the phone rings you know yeah. you, you've got this quiet time carved out now Tell us, tell us in practical ways of getting into the word. What do you do or what, what did you do when you first started 
getting well, I, I, I'm lucky in that I've managed, I've had a scholar's life, I, I, you know. I, yes. I, I, and so I've been able to get into the word all day, every day for, you know, 40 something years. Uh, and, and, and that's unusual. But a lot of people who are busy, I tell them to get the U version app on their phone. They can read the Bible on their phone and also has an audio Bible thing. So they can set it up, Bluetooth it in their car, going into work, press the audio Bible and listen to, you know, First Samuel or something as they're driving. Uh, and so there's ways to get the word of God into your life, you know, side loaded into your head uh, and to uh, the even... If you, you know, the classic example is a mother with three kids under five. How on earth is she going to get an hour's quiet time? The answer is probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are people whose life is absolutely hectic and they, they have to get the word of God into them, uh, or listen to a Christian radio uh, a station or, or have the U version app playing or, you know, sneak a little bit of a, a, a Bible video in. Uh, and you have to be creative about how to do that and just ask, Lord, you know, Please help my kids to sleep for an hour this afternoon so I can study your word. And you have to fit it in around your routine because uh, that's just life. Uh, and uh, so uh, just be determined and, and find a routine that works with you. Now, when I was young, I was very much a night owl. So I would have my quiet time at night and I enjoyed doing that. And I would go to sleep very peacefully because I was useless in the morning. I just staring at I was not really competent till 10 o'clock in the morning, but I had to start functioning at seven at Theological College. So, I, I, but I wasn't really there as a human being. So having a morning quiet time didn't work for other people who are, who are, I love getting up early in the morning and that's fine for them. So just work with your natural rhythms of your day and try and get the word of God in. Now, start with the New Testament, not with the old. Start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just read through the New Testament. That's a great way to, to read your Bible. The Old Testament can get some very complicated things. And read the New Testament twice right through before you tackle the Old Testament. Now, that's, it's interesting that you say that because I did just the opposite. And I, I just had, when I accepted the Lord, maybe I was different than mm. most people. I am kind of an oddball. Mm. But... I was so hungry to get into this book yep. that I started from the beginning and believe it or not, right. much to my surprise, I kept saying to myself as I was reading, oh my goodness, I didn't know this happened. Yeah. Wow. What? And I just kept saying, oh, wow, great. I, everything just kind of came alive to me. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't get enough. I just kept reading and, and hours would pass. Mm. And I think, how, how can I, 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 I'd, I'd start reading as soon as the kids got, you know, as I, when I got home from dropping them off at school and I would sit there for hours and I would think, oh my gosh, I've got to go get the kids. I, I was mesmerized by the mm. word of God and, and maybe that's unusual, but um, I just kept going and, and some of the some of the the names were really tough, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first five books of the Bible. There's Hebrew names in there that we never use today, mm -hmm. but um, it for some reason didn't stumble me. Mm -hmm. I just kept moving forward. But you know, it it truly was the Holy Spirit um, giving me understanding, um, opening up the Word, washing me with the Word. But yes, I agree. You know. Um, as we had a, my husband and I had a Muslim ministry for years, mm -hmm. um, and we would, as they would accept the Lord, we would give them just the book of John mm -hmm. or, and, and then send them maybe a whole Bible, but just to get them, <coughs> excuse me, started. Mm -hmm. But, the, but the main thing is to get into the book and he'll do the rest. Yes. And one of the things people ask, which Bible version do you like? Well, I, I, I recommend getting one as what we call a fairly literal version that's close to the original Hebrew and Greek. So I, I say the New American Standard Bible or the New King James Version. The King James Version is very accurate, but it uses very old English. That we, Not only don't we understand it, but it misleads us. For instance, 
The word handsome back in the day of King James Version meant sly, tricky, and devious. So when it said Absalom was handsome, it meant he was sly, sly, tricky, and devious. It didn't mean he was good looking. But the word handsome has lost that meaning, and now it just means good looking. So terrible in the in the Old Testament, um, or I I think it it or was it terrible? Yeah, um, yeah. Terrible was a kind of a good sense of something that was awesome, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and so, uh, so you know, I like the King James English personally, but it's very confusing. And so, uh, I don't use the King James Bible personally in a teaching setting because there are people there who just these and thou's and stuff just throw them for a loop if you like your king james english uh, by all means go ahead and, and use it but i i tend to stick with uh, uh either the uh, christian standard version the uh esv english standard version king, new king james version or the, the new american standard bible and those those are good i dodge the niv because i've taught the bible for years and the niv airbrushes stuff uh and i find that it's a very sanitized Bible that's fairly suitable for sort of middle class America. But I teach overseas and it, it just leaves out a lot to be desired. And it's also inconsistent for word study. So the same Greek word is translated multiple different ways and it makes it very hard for word study. So NIV is okay, uh, but I prefer not to use it. Now, now um, do you find that when you're teaching um in different countries that applies i mean yeah. yes the, the, the niv is what i wouldn't use overseas so much i would use i would use something the new king james version seems to work cross-culturally quite well okay okay so get into the word is the as is, yeah, is, yeah. is the thing um and then of course um get into a good church yeah. now um i know for a fact that um after I accepted the Lord, I was going through the yellow pages to look yeah. for churches. And I I wanted to go to a Bible study every day because my kids yeah. are in school. Yeah. And and I figured out real quick which churches really helped me. Yeah. Um, and it, it might be difficult for people to find a good church. So what do you recommend? Uh, I, I recommend you you look at the church and, and look at the if it's got a website, but go and have a look at the statement of faith, uh, and and have a look at also its purposes and things like that. If there's a nice strong biblical statement of faith, particularly, it should say a couple of things. Firstly, it should say they believe in the Trinity: God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's that's absolutely vital. They should believe in being born again and, and saved, and they should believe in what we call the inerrancy of Scripture. In other words, they should believe that the Bible is important, real, and doesn't have mistakes in it. And that will that's uh, something that's that's very important, to see the inerrancy of Scripture, that God's Word is inspired, authority, and fully inerrant. Uh, and so that's good. And then have a look at the, the church to see if uh, it's surrounding a personality or whether it's just straight out worshiping God, churches that have rock star pastors can end up in a lot of trouble. Those rock star pastors tend to crash and burn. But if the pastor is a good, honest man of God, and you feel authentic around that pastor, uh, that's that's good. Uh, and then uh, look at this at what the church's purpose statement is. And if it says we want to evangelize the the world and you know save the lost, good. Okay, that sounds like a good church. And if it puts a strong emphasis on the Bible, the Word of God, the cross, salvation, that's probably going to be a good church. Right, right. That's that's really good information. I know that, um, I, as you probably know, I've interviewed a lot of people, and um, I've had people call me and say, you know, they'd like to be on my show or something. And and um, if I don't know them, I have to ask them what church they go to. Where do they yeah. fellowship? And I remember... Um, this one person that um, <clears throat> called me, I went to her, the, the church's website, and I found out um, that through my investigation, not just looking at the um, that, but it was a Jesus only. I don't yeah. know if you know that, but Jesus only. I, I've never really thought about Jesus only. Yeah. 
But as I got into it, it was a Jesus only church. And, and I love Jesus, but you know, it, we do serve a triune God. And yes. I try to say that on this program a lot because of that one incident of trying to vet this person. And I, honestly, I don't really have time to vet people. Um, so when, when people ask me I, that I, people that I don't know, I usually say no, wow. because it just takes too long for, for me to vet them and their whole thing. But yeah, um, there, there are things that you have to look for that uh, could be a red flag. Yeah, a good sign also is a church that when you go there, seems friendly, loving, and real. You know, if a church is cold and aloof, or if a church is sort of fake and funny, you go there and say, oh, this is plastic. They're just, they're just talking at me. They're just being nice to me. This isn't authentic. Uh, you, you want to dodge out of there because God's real and God's loving and kind. And if the church is the fruit of the Spirit, uh, then just look for what are the people like. So, you know, we really are relying on the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. So yeah. we've accepted the Lord. We have this desire from the Holy Spirit to get into his word, uh, you know, God's word, so that we can grow and, and then get into fellowship mm -hmm. um, at, at a really good church. And, and hopefully you have time to go to a Bible study once a week, yeah. uh, be it in the, you know, at that church or another one. Uh, sometimes the church that you choose, um, um, like I, there was a church that I was involved in that their, their Wednesday night service was split up men went one way and women went the other way. And my husband and I chose to, you know, want to be together um, versus kind of being split up. So we went, you know, elsewhere for the Wednesday night service. But um, hopefully God leads you to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, get into a good church and get, get into a Bible study. Mm -hmm. It's more than a once a week deal with mm -hmm. God. It's an everyday deal. Yes, and I, one thing I want to add in there is it's been very important to me is to have a prayer partner. Uh, and I was single for an awfully long while because I was running around being a missionary and women sort of looked at me like, oh, he's a nerd and a missionary, no thanks. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, I, I had to have people giving me input about my walk with God and praying with me and who I could ring up and say, oh, look, you know, I'm going through this. And so I always seek to have someone who's a prayer partner and once a week, we would meet for an hour, hour and a half, sometimes longer. Uh, and we would pray for each other's needs and share around the scripture and talk about our thoughts about God and the universe, etc. And so I think it's important to have someone else. You can't do it on your own. And at church, it church is great, but no one's talking to you about you. Right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 can't get, you can't get your chest off in a church service. Uh, and so... I'd find someone, the Lord would lead me to someone and to have a prayer partner who uh, you can share the word of God with and, and just share life with. And I've, been, I've had some friends for you know, decades that uh, I can pray with. I really agree with that. And, you know, the, my first prayer partner was accidental. Mm. I, I went and uh, delivered something to her through another friend mm. and we just connected and she mm. asked for my phone number and we called each other every day, um, even for maybe five or 10 minutes just to pray. And mm. we've come to love each other's children because, you know, the, our kids grew up together and having a prayer partner is so key. But also I, I found that one, one of the things that was also good for me was um, having a prayer partner, maybe, maybe a second prayer partner that um, was older than me. Yep. Um, somebody that could had was older in the Lord, um, older in age, so that they'd lived a little bit longer in life. That could kind of guide me on simple things, and um, and and for for me, that person uh, would we would have lunch once a week, and she yeah. would kind of listen to me and hear my moans and groans about different things, and and could guide me. I, I really felt like that was really helpful. And my walk with the Lord as well. <clears throat> Particularly when you're young, uh, you're dating, uh, you may get bumped into unsuitable relationships uh, and your colleagues are as dumb as you are uh, <laughs> often. Yeah. Uh, and having an older person saying John or whatever, uh, that person is, uh, you know, 
uh, that you, you like is completely unsuitable for you, please, you know, don't be that dumb uh, uh, or whatever the situation is uh, in your life. When you're making decisions, having someone of older experience who can, who can guide you along the way, that's it's extremely helpful and it's good to listen to them and it's good to get over the generation gap, uh, to ha have the maturity to listen to someone whose tastes are not your tastes at all, uh, who's from another generation, another era, and uh, that. So we, because here in Western society, we get very encapsulated into our own little 10 year group that travels mm -hmm. with us. And so the people 10 years younger than us, oh, they're those young people, they're no, they're no good. And people 10 years older than us are absolutely ancient, might be a little more than that. Uh, and so we tend to just hang with a certain group of people. And that's not healthy, it divides the body of Christ also cuts us off from a lot of wisdom that we could otherwise have in our life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some something that struck me is um, when I get together with this friend, um, we always um, talked about things that were pertinent, but it always revolved around how God was going to solve this or yeah. be in this and giving glory to him when he answered prayers and things like that. It was just so great to have that. Mm. older wiser person um and and the other older wiser person in my life was my mom mm. who had been a christian for a long time but sometimes there were things that i didn't really want to share with my mom so yeah. this older wiser person was really good for me in that yeah. in that area um so that's good now the other thing that um i i think i should point out is something sometimes we have to kind of leave some of our friends behind. Oh yeah. And, and, and spend more time with, with people that know and love God so that we're growing in that same direction um, that Jesus wants us to. Um, did that happen to you, John? Yeah. It says that it's just a thing called the doctrine of separation, which is a fancy title for leaving the separating yourself out from the garbage. It says, leave all that behind and particularly for the gentile church in the new testament they came out of a world that was full of idols they'd been worshiping athena or they'd been worshiping aphrodite some of those temples had temple prostitutes the festivals were really bad and demonic and they had to walk out from that very worldly world that they'd been part of and the stinking thinking we see testimonies these days on facebook and twitter and someone said i was like this this and this uh, and I was doing all this crazy stuff and, you know, the drugs, the alcohol and, you know, all that. And that after, and then I left that and I left my crazy friends who were dragging me down uh, with methamphetamine or something. And now I'm I'm clean and saved and whole. But I mean, they can't go back to the crazy friends. They can't go back to the meth dealer. They can't go back to the, the pagan evil ways. And we need to say, no, we can't do that. And sometimes it's a small thing that's critical for that person. So... For me, I had to stop playing tournament chess. Now, you think that's a pretty mild thing. But yeah. uh, right. But for me, I was a tournament chess player. I was highly competitive. I wanted to destroy the person across the board from me. Mm -hmm. I was a complete egomaniac when it came to playing chess. And I could not be a Christian and play chess terribly well. <laughs> so early on in my Christian discipleship, I had to give up playing tournament chess and playing squash, I think it's similar to what you Americans call racquetball, but you slam this ball around a court and you bash it into other people. It's part of the game, and it's highly competitive. Uh, and I was I played to to destroy, you know, and so I had to give up those things. Now I wasn't doing any drugs or alcohol when I was say or anything particularly wild, but I had to to put my ego. I had to put my ego on ice, and that was pretty hard for me. And so uh, each of us have things we have to separate out from. Uh, and, and then we have to say, okay, I'm going to hang out with better people and I'm going to do better things. And at one point, uh, quite a few years later, I, I unplugged the television because I was addicted to watching cricket. Now, cricket, a game of cricket goes for five days. Wow, uh, I didn't know that. A test cricket, right. So I'd be glued. It's worse than baseball. So you would be glued to the TV for hour after hour watching this thing. And I said, look, I've got to get on with my ministry. I can't watch cricket. And the only way to stop myself from watching cricket was to completely unplug a television. I didn't have one from, I think, uh, 1985 to 2000. Then we had the 2000 Olympics in Australia, and I got a little black and white TV so I could 
watch the, the Olympics. But even these days, I don't watch a bunch of television. Uh, I'm not against TV, but I, I know that for just for me, just for John, once I sit in front of that thing, I'm there for a long while. Uh, and I've got to just say, okay, that's a gigantic waste of time. That's my weakness. I've got to get it out of my life. Wow. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point for a lot of us. Um, the, the other thing that I was thinking about was, um, for me, I there, there was a short time in my life that I started smoking. Right. And it was so at, at the time that I, you know, accepted the Lord, I, I, I was smoking. And I remember going to church and I was the only one that left church and started to light up right away. No yeah. one said anything. No one looked at me strange. Um, and I remember the first time I did that, I was looking all over for like an ashtray outside <laughs> and, and I didn't want to put it in the planner. And I, I thought, wow, how do I get rid of this? And that's what caused me to stop smoking after I came out of church, because there were no ashtrays around. But of course, when I, you know, got home or whatever, I stood outside and yeah. had a cigarette or whatever, until the Lord um, told me through a book I was reading, I was reading this book called Like a Mighty Wind, that was written by Mel Torrey. I've got and, to read that book. Everyone says it's terrific. Yeah, it is. It is. And you know, in that book, while he was in Indonesia, mm -hmm. there was uh, there's a testimony that he shares how, you know, someone was raised from the dead, uh, which, oh my gosh. But anyhow, he couldn't wait to come to America. And as he was walking down the aisle of the, you know, LAX, he said there were pictures of cigarette people smoking and, and, and wine and beer and alcohol, you know, ads all through that and mm -hmm. all over the the billboards up and down the freeway and he thought wow this is weird i expected something different um I, here's here they put on their money and god we trust and there's billboards of smoking and drinking and i thought to myself i was a baby christian then i thought well what's wrong with smoking yeah. and the lord really touched my heart and said i want you to give that up and i did I mean, he took it away from me right away. But yeah, um, some things happen right away after you're saved, and some things um, happen gradually, like the TV watching. Yeah, and what I want to add to it is some people are trapped in a job that is against the will of God. I knew a chap who was uh, selling cable TV programs, including very pornographic ones. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's the only job I've got. I've got to sell these. And I said, you'll be cursed. You cannot sell that garbage to people. Yeah. Uh, you cannot, you've got to find another job. And, and he didn't listen and, and he had a lot of trouble in his life until he quit that job. You can't have a job where you're doing evil things or you're, you're selling from a script that you know is deceptive. You know the product doesn't meet that script. You know, you know it's a scam, you know. You can't be part of a scam. You can't be selling, you know, pornographic garbage. And things like that and be a christian you your work has to line up with your faith and occasionally that means changing jobs mm -hmm. so back to and and that's all part of growing um mm -hmm. in the lord so we talked about changing our friends possibly changing our job mm -hmm. but really being led by the spirit to do yeah. what the bible calls us to do mm -hmm. um and and uh, you know we don't all have to go to go to africa no. to save the world but we're all called to do to to um the the great commission aren't we yeah, ephesians 2 10 is a, one of the key verses uh and it says that you're a new creation in christ jesus and god has uh pre-arranged good works for you to do uh, and so god's got all these work good works lined up for you to do and some of us just shoot off and neglect them but God has a life planned for you. He's got a destiny for you. And it involves lining up and doing these works of kindness and helpfulness and loving service. That say, let me just grab my Bible and read, read it out exactly rather than paraphrasing it like I just did. So uh, it talks about our, so eight, eight and nine, verses eight and nine talks about how we're saved by grace, not works. But then it says, let's start at verse eight. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by our good works. We get to heaven by faith. But we say four good works that God's prepared beforehand for us to do. And so there's things that God wants me to do. Like I'm a Bible teacher. That's pretty easy for me to know what my good work is. Uh, I go out and do that. But there's also things that my wife and I do together. And uh, we've had a ministry of hospitality, having people in our home for months or years at a time, helping people who've fallen on very hard times. Uh, and we have other good works, of charitable works, that God calls us to do. And when, when it's from God, it's okay. When we try and help people just out of our own sympathy and it's not from God and we overstep the bound, we can get in some really tangled situations. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to ask God and say, is this person, are we helping this person out, out of our, because it's one of the good works you've called us to do or are we just uh, shooting off at a tangent here? So God has good works he's prepared for you. He's given you the gifts. He's given you the capacity uh, for instance, my wife is an extremely good large-scale cook. She can easily cook for 20 people at the drop of a hat. Uh, and I enjoy doing all the background things, you know, setting up the chairs and, and running around doing the shopping and things. So between us, we can we can do a reasonably large event at a couple of hours' notice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and we have that and we enjoy that and it doesn't burn us out. Someone else will say, oh, we're dropping 20 people over at your place. We'll go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so it's up, uh, and but we but there's other things I cannot do. I cannot do detailed administration. I cannot do like bookkeeping, accounting, those kind of things. Uh, and so we each have our strengths. We each have our our weaknesses. And and God has got good works that just designed for you. You can do them. You'll enjoy them. Someone else will hate them. Uh, mm -hmm. And you go you go out and you do those good works and commit your Christian life to saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do next? And you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, and when you're doing what God's made you to do, you'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do. I like the scripture also that um, where and, and you could do several different you can go several different directions with these scriptures. But I like the scripture where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Mm. And he says, feed my sheep. Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, Peter says, yes. And he says, feed my lambs first and then feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Mm. And, and, and yeah, when we, when we love Jesus, we really want to do work for him and not because we have to, but because we love him and, um, and we feel called to do it. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I do love that scripture. The, the other thing I did want to talk about is as we're, um, called to do you know some kind of work for the lord um i i remember when i was in school i i i was the first one to raise my hand for the teacher i was going to volunteer for everything i could because uh and the teacher would say to me sometimes uh Rody, i didn't even tell you what we're going to do mm -hmm. and i i didn't care what it was i was going to shoot my hand up first but but we we Christians can sometimes get into a little bit of trouble by by volunteering, by trying to do everything there is under the sun for God. Oh, absolutely. But, absolutely. We, we need to listen. And when God says, don't do that, like, for instance, I tra normally travel a lot and God's just clamped on it this year. I can't travel. You know, like, no, you're not traveling. I'm going like, I like traveling. I don't mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and so sometimes God just does good things for us and tells us not to do things because it's going to end up as a tangled mess. Uh, and um, so, you know, there are, are times when God will just say, stop, I want you to focus on this and not that. So I would love to be an evangelist and have crowds of 10,000 people, but I'm a Bible teacher and generally teach 40 people uh, and in, in a Bible college classroom somewhere. So the... Uh, God has different ministries for each of us. We have to be content with that and not try and shoot off at tangents that we're not meant to be doing because you can get distracted. You can get out of your lane. You need to stick to the netting that God's given you. 
Okay, there's a couple of things that I want to talk to before uh, talk about before we end. And one thing is um, the quiet time with the Lord. Yeah. I, you know, I, I love getting into the word with the yeah. Lord and things like that. But I think it's important to carve out a time, yes. maybe not every day, but carve out a time at least once, maybe twice a week, where you're really spending time with him. Right. And I, what I mean by that is, um, for me, what it means is, you know, shutting the world out, mm. start out with maybe some praise music. I've got some things on my playlist on my phone that I can just quickly turn to and and get into that attitude of praying and and wanting to, you know, um, worship God and um, and be that that's maybe even before I. Uh, even start praying, just get into s singing a few songs or whatever. And, and then um, I, I like to just kind of pray things that are heavy on my, ch my mind, because if I can't, if I can't get that off my chest, sometimes I can't move forward. Yes. Um, this is just bothering to me too much. I've got to just tell you all about this Lord. Like he doesn't know, but I've got to get it off my chest and onto his shoulders and then really spending some time in the word. Now, um, I don't do that every day. I, I, you know, I'd like to say I do. I, I don't. I do spend time with him. Um, maybe um, get I do get into the word every day, but I'm talking about more than that, more than just reading the word, more than maybe just reading a daily devotional. I'm talking about spending time at his feet. Well, I, I find it's very helpful for me to have a journal, a spiritual journal I write in uh, because I have a 600 mile an hour mind. And if I don't, if writing focuses it down. So it's not bouncing off the ceiling all the time. Yeah. Uh, so I write out my thoughts to God and my questions and my prayer points. And that really helps me to stay focused and to develop my thinking uh, and not to be all over the shop with you know this and then suddenly i'm thinking about politics or some something i heard on the news and ding 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 so writing it down helps to be to keep on track the other thing that some people do is they call acts adoration confession thanksgiving supplication so adoration you start in worship confession you get those heavy things off your soul that you were talking about uh thanksgiving you say thank you lord these problems are yours i'm not worrying about them anymore and supplication is uh, you're asking for your prayer points now one of the things that i mentioned on the prayer thing that i did with you and say to people is have a prayer list otherwise mm -hmm. you end up self-centered you start talking to god just about your stuff or the, the random things in your head have a prayer list have a prayer guide it might be from a ministry it might be praying for the nations of the world whatever even have a map on your wall for on your wall for countries you pray for uh, and get out of your own stinking thinking, out of your own selfish priorities and start praying for the sick people in your church or the neighbours next door or for your neighbourhood or for God to bring revival in your city and write them down. Otherwise, they'll pop out of your head. Have a written prayer list of some point. Stick it in your Bible or in your prayer notebook uh, and keep it there and bring it out regularly to pray over it so you don't end up with a totally self-centred Christian life. Okay, yes, that's really helpful. And the last thing I want to talk about is the Bible says um, how obedience is better than sacrifice. Right. And of course, we know that the Jews sacrificed, um, for the, they, they brought their sacrificial things to the Lord so they could be forgiven for their sins and so on and so forth. But uh, obeying what the Lord tells us and, and also tithing um talk about that a little, a little bit we've got about two more minutes okay it's in, it's important to obey god in the tough stuff when god says do it you do it uh and god might say okay i want you to give x amount to the church or i want you to tithe a good guideline uh, i don't get legalistic about tithing but i think it's a good guideline to give a tenth of your income back to the lord uh, as he's given, and you keep 90%, he gets 10% at least. Uh, but uh, God wants you to obey him. That may mean apologizing to someone you don't want to apologize to. It might mean doing things and setting aside time for the Lord when you feel you're really busy. 
it might be just an ordinary thing like go and, and help your wife when you want to be lazy and sit in front of the television and mm -hmm. you get up and you do it because you're obedient to the lord and the lord says love your wife and sacrifice for it go and do that go and do the things you don't feel like doing uh, and uh, and that's the obedience. When you see a command, turn the other cheek. You obey the Lord's command. You, you you obey what Jesus says, and you're aware of those if you read the Bible. And you just say, okay, I'm going to do that out of obedience. Right. I I, I think about the fact that um, um, when when Abraham died, um, his two sons had to come together after. Um, not seeing each other for probably a long time. Um, um, Esau and, was it Esau? Isaac. No, 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 not Esau. Um, Isaac and Ishmael. Um, Ishmael, Ishmael um, and, um, and Jacob um, had to come together to bury their dad. Um, so they finally got to kind of mend the fences. And sometimes we have to die to ourselves to, to get to, um, apologize to, to people that we want to hold a grudge with. Um, and, and the Lord really uh, wants us to be obedient to him. I do want to thank you again so much, um, John, for sharing from your heart and, and, and giving us those lessons that we need to, um, you know, do as we grow in the Lord um, and, and, and having this walk with Jesus. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, I would like, oh, go ahead. It's a pleasure, Roddy. Enjoy being here. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to speak to those that are listening that um, have either accepted the Lord or maybe you need to rededicate yourself to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Maybe your, your walk has been dry lately and it's simply coming to him. He's waiting for you. He's waiting to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Um, to either give your heart to the Lord for the first time and nothing you've done in your in as you've walked through the desert, if you're in that dry place, that would hold you back from coming to him. He's waiting to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Simply ask him to come into your life again, afresh and anew, if you've never if you've done it before and would like to walk with him again. Or if you're new at this, mm -hmm and you are wanting to accept Jesus as your savior, simply tell him and recognize that you're a sinner. He died for us sinners and you need a savior. Mm. And have him wash your heart as white as snow and follow him. You know, when he called Matthew, he didn't say, hey, come over here. Matthew, it, it says, I believe it's in Matthew 9, he says there was a there once there was a man named Matthew. He looked at this man named Matthew. Jesus just looked at him and he dropped everything. Mm. Followed him. If that's you today, he's waiting to hear from him from you. Drop everything and follow him. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, listeners and viewers, and thank you again, John for all that good insight on being a mature Christian. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun. And whenever you have a spot, I'd love to be back on to talk to your audience. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. I, I, I'm going to have to look over your, your long list of things that you so eloquently teach, right. but um, have a safe trip. I know that you're leaving uh, um, uh, for a getaway and, yeah. and I, I pray that the Lord will really, really help you on that new book of yours. Gosh, thank you for joining us today on The Road with Jesus. Join us again. God bless you. Bye for now. We love you. There is a hope and a light that shines.